Father, we just want to thank you for this your Shabbat. Father, we thank you for this time, this family. Father, we thank you that we could just come and sit at your feet. Father, as we study your Torah, we pray that you would lead us. Pray that you would open up our eyes to your truth, Father, to where we see Yeshua from the very beginning, the Ruach HaKodesh, Father, the plan of redemption, Father. We just want to thank you. Father, thank you for these truths that we can hold on to them, Father. We can hold on to these promises. We can hold on to these images, Father, so that we know who we are in you. And we just give you glory. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, okay. Open up to Genesis chapter 2. I've got a couple of questions regarding that. Chapter 2. After number 1. Okay. After chapter 1, or what, regarding chapter 1 or chapter 2? Beginning chapter 2. Okay. Bring it. My wife has a couple of questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> under the bus field. I <laughs> threw <laughs> <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright. Chapter. Yes, you do. Okay. Alright. In Genesis one, mm -hmm. it says that. God created man and woman. Mm -hmm. Beginning of chapter 2, it says that he formed the man and breathed in his nostrils. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. But in Genesis 1 already, it says that he created man. Okay. All right. Those are, those are very good points. Now, we'll get there, but in the midst of it, we have to answer it, right? Remember... The theme that runs through better sheet is what? Um, origin. This is how things happen. Not, not creation, origins. Origin. The origin, or you can say the history. Okay. So what we have in Genesis chapter 1 is the origin of what? Creation. Okay, so you can say God created everything. God was there and He spoke all of creation into seven literal days. That's something we did not have time to touch on. Okay? Seven literal days. We agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, and it spoke about sunset to sunset, this is the day. Yeah. Okay, so He gives us seven days of creation and we saw a little pattern of this is what that is. Man was created on day... Six. Right. Now what happens in Genesis chapter 2 is he goes on and he says, All right, now you see the outline, I'm going to give you some filling. Okay, so it's not that it's now this was created and then this story happened. This is what's happening and this is what's overlapping. And that's how it happened. Right. Okay, so it's not two separate accounts of creation. It's creation in a framework of seven days. And this overlaps in the midst of it and he goes... Let me, let me talk to you about how I created man quickly. When did that happen? We oh, that was on the sixth day, right? That's correct. Now let's talk about the details thereof. Uh, okay. okay, so he's going to peel apart certain aspects of the things he needs to know. Notice, when we go through chapter 2, he's really not going to spend too much time on dinosaurs. Mm. <laughs> he's not going to talk to you about what type of fish and lizards and all types of fun things that he spoke about. It's like, look, I created everything. Do we get the point of it? Mm. Moshe? Yes, Lord. Happy days. Let's talk about the hot topic. Remember, he's setting up the story. If we understand the traditional element is Moses is receiving this at Sinai. Why am I telling you this, Moses? Because you need to figure out how we got here. I need them to know who I am, not just the God who conquered Egypt, but I am the God of all creation. He says, but if you were from the beginning, how did we get to a place of the God of this and the God of that and the God of that and the, 
all the rest of it and where did Abraham really come from? How did you meet him? What's the story? He's leading him back to Sinai, just like he did when he said, Moses, meet you at the burning bush. Now go and fetch them and bring them back and they will worship me at this mountain. Right? Same thing. Moses, sit down. Let's talk. 40 days and 40 nights he sat on that mountain. Did he really just receive 10, 10, 10 words? No. Yeah. Exactly. What was he doing there for that time? According, <laughs> according to tradition, this is the story that he was given so that now we have the account from God's viewpoint, not man's. You notice with all different versions of religion, it doesn't matter which one you aim at, none of them really give an account of creation. They all want to give you their opinion of what's going to happen at the end, but no one was claiming there from the very beginning. And yeah, you have God stepping up and goes, look, I was there from the beginning. I know the beginning. I know the end from the beginning. I know how I'm going to get you back there. And this is how I'm going to use Christ and the Holy Spirit and those things to bring everything together. No other religion has those answers. Okay? So he knew what we needed to try and establish that reality. And this is what he's going to try and unpack. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So let's go back. Um, I thought for the sake of continuity, because I don't want you guys to get super hung up on a single translation. Okay. I'm going to read... Uh, also based on a Hebrew translation, a guy by the name of uh, Richard Elliot Friedman is a rabbi who gives a commentary thereof. What's it going to do? Not much. It might phrase a word here or there difference, but it's going to give you the gist. Okay? So remember, when you're studying your text, try and use two or three different Bibles. It's, 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 it's good to test things. Okay. So chapter 2, verse 1, we ended off with, with what? 2, verse 1. Yeah. We finished chapter, the beginning of chapter 2. It was the seventh day. And then, so he goes into the creation and we go into chapter 2 and the seventh day was about Shabbat. Right? Shabbat, a creation reality. Okay, while we're there, Shabbat is also where else mentioned and why, why is it important? Other places four. Four. <laughs> various <laughs> other places, including Torah 4, number 4. Uh, I mean, in the Torah, in uh, Exodus, number 4. Yes, yes. right, yeah. Exodus 20, we have it in the fourth commandment. Okay, where else is it mentioned? Isaiah. In Isaiah? Yes. In Isaiah 56, <laughs> where it talks about the foreigners lining themselves up and God honors that reality. Exodus 31, where Shabbat is a sign between me and you. Remember those? Okay, Isaiah 58 gives us a little bit of an inkling of if we call Shabbat a delight. Right? Am I going too fast? Okay. Stop me if someone's fallen off. All right, so this is a big thing, a big topic, but it's there. From verse 4. These are the records of the skies and the earth when they were created in the day that Hashem, God, made earth and skies. Okay, so, um, just a side note. What do you guys have there as, in verse 4, read, read it in your translation. He saw the birth of heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day of Adonai Elohim, made earth and heavens. All right. Do you notice that Adonai there is in all caps? Mm. What does it mean when it's in all caps? When God is in all caps? Wasn't it the first time it was mentioned? Well, this is Lord God. Lord, Lord in all caps. Yes, Lord is in all caps. And sometimes you will have God in all caps. Whenever you see Lord or Adonai or God in caps, understand that is the name yud Hey vav Hey. Right. Remember that when he was talking to Moses at the burning bush, he says, I have revealed to him as yud Hey vav Hey." But here, all the way from the point of Genesis, that a hand reveals, a nail reveals, is there from the beginning. 
Okay, so just a side note to point that out. He goes, these are the records. Okay, he says um, in chapter 2 verse 5, when all produce of the field had not yet been in the earth and all the vegetation of the field had not yet grown for for, the, for Adonai God had not yet reigned on the earth, and there had been no human to work the ground. Mm. And a river had come up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. What does your translation talk about? Neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not yet sent rain to, to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Okay, right, so there has been no way for these things to kind of spring up, so he invented a watering system in the midst of his creation scenario, okay? It's funny you say, much because if you go and press on that little love bubble key, it's going to be in the text, it's just mist. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to allude to that because rain only really is um, invented in the time of Noah. Mm. It's the first time they ever see it. So before that, it was only mist. Mm. And it came from the ground, not from the sky. Yeah, mm. which Bible is... Bible likes flesh. It's true, that witness that which pops up every morning, yes, mm. that's it is. Okay, so it says, Adonai God fashioned a human dust from the ground. Yeah, this translation is very funny, hey? Dust from the ground and blew into his nostrils and the breath of life and the human became a living being. Okay, similar reality. He takes and he creates Adam out of? All right, so here's the Hebrew word play. Dust is Adamma. Adamma. Okay? It's a play on the word. Adam means mankind. Okay? It's human. This is mankind. All right, with the fact that we call him Adam, is it's kind of like a non-starter. He was like, this is human, is basically what you would call him. Okay? And he came from the Adama, the dust or the soil. So the fact that his name, it's sort of like Hebrew uh, poetry, that he kind of goes, don't forget where you come from. Your very name tells you where you came from. And he takes him and he breathes into him. And that is like the Ruach, a breath or a spirit. And then he becomes what? A living soul. A living soul. The word here for a living being or a living soul is the word nefesh. A living being. Now, funny enough, when you talk about your nefesh, in some cases it deals with your flesh. Yeah. Okay, you guys know what I'm talking about when I say flesh? Yeah. Your mind, what are your emotions? <laughs> it's part of your song, friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, one, career, uh, one Thessalonians taught us that you're made up in three parts. Mm -hmm. Spirit, soul, body. Okay? Now, part of this reality is, remember, we spoke a little bit about being made up in His image. Okay, and we spoke about Elohim being made up of the word, alluding to three or more. Yad, Yadaim, Yadim. El, Elohim, Elohim. <laughs> Pause. Elohim talks about three. Okay, so if I talk about the singular version of the word God is hell. Elohim tells me three or more. And 
the other one? El Hayim. I would, if I were to make an illusion of saying two gods. So it's, uh, I prefer using the word Yad because sounding like two gods is weird. Yad is a hand. Um, Yada Aim is hands as in two. Yadim is three hands or more. It's 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 just one of those funny word plays that kind of just give you an illusion to say that he's talking about more than one. Is that better? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you see me? All right. So when we're dealing with Elohim, one of those aspects is let's deal with the three parts: spirit. Soul and nefesh sometimes is an illusion between really those two aspects of man. Soul is roughly translated as your mind, your will, and your emotion. Yeah? So what I want you to see, before the fall, if we were to take those three things, spirit, soul, and body, you're going to act according to what's your priority, correct? When you listen to the story, or when we get to chapter three, I want you to try and identify which one is the priority. Is it focus on self, how I feel, what I think, or what I choose? Is it focusing on God, as in how he communicates and his instruction? Or is it focusing on, on the outside and how it feels and what it means to me? Okay. Because this reality will continue to chase us pretty much through the entire book, all 66 books. And if you can start to recognize the different um, priorities in people, i.e. whether they're a fleshly Christian, a soulish Christian, or a spiritual Christian, all are saved. They have different priorities. Am I losing you guys? Is that making sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so sometimes we get to the place where people are... Um, Theologies are invented because it feeds the emotion more than it actually feeds the spirit. Okay, that's that's what I'm alluding to. Okay, and this is that you know, this is what we're going to see is it's 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 in reality it's it's a people problem. All right. Okay, so he tells us he goes all right. Let's talk about Adam for a second, and he took sand or dust and he blew into it and he became a living being. This is a separate reality than normal creation, yes? He created the animals by going lion, ox, bunny. Yeah, he said this is it, and they were formed that way, just like he created all other living beings. With man, he does something slightly different. He couldn't have named them because Adam was asked to name them. Yeah. So what he just. <laughs> <laughs> My man. <mate. laughs> Maybe it might be it might be a it might be a it might be a scenario where Adam <laughs> called them something as in what we call them and God's gonna go I never called them that. That's a funny. We can we can figure out that reality one day when we sit at his feet. You, you, you ever heard that would hose me? You guys are funny. You call that a bunny rabbit. <laughs> All right, verse, verse 8. It says, And Hashem God planted a garden in Eden. In Eden. What does Eden mean? Gan Eden. Gan is garden. Eden. Roughly translated, not just name, but paradise. 
Mm. Okay? So it's, it's why we think Garden of Eden is a paradise, because the name literally is paradise in Hebrew, okay? And it says he planted it at the east. Mm -hmm. Now this is an interesting picture that comes up later. Mm -hmm. And he set the human whom he had fashioned there, and Hashem God caused every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for eating to grow from the ground, and the tree of life within the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Okay, good and evil, rah, same, same reality, good and bad. And the river was going out from Eden to water the garden, and it was dispersed from there, and it became four heads. The name of one was Pishon, that which on is the circles all the land of Havilah, where the gold, where there is gold. And that land's gold is good. Bedullam and onyx stone are there. And the name of the second is Gihon. That is one that encircles all the land of Cush. Cush, uh, from what we believe, is Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And the name of the third river is Tigris. That is the one that goes east of Assyria. And the fourth river, that is Euphrates. Okay? And Hashem God took, or the Lord God, took the human, took man, and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the human, saying, You may eat from every tree of the garden, but from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, you shall not eat of it, because in the day you eat of it, you will die. Okay. So, yeah, he gives us four rivers that tell us the territory of where the garden is. Okay, funny enough, those four rivers do not intersect at one singular point today. But that could be for a number of reasons. Number one, he hid it so that we wouldn't get back into it. Not until the time is right. Number two, Noah's flood. Right? Rivers that were above or now underground in certain cases, things had been carved out completely separate. The landscape before the flood looked very different from the landscape after the flood. Okay? And he says again, this is the detail. I planted him. I put, I planted him. I put Adam there. He was over there and his job was to look after everything in the garden. Happy days. This is your purpose in life. Become a gardener. The end. <laughs> Why, why, do you, why would he give you that detail? For what reason? Why would he give you what reason? The detail that he, that, he put, that he made mankind and he put them in a garden. What's the point? God had a purpose and a function. Okay. So in that purpose and function? He was a gardener. He was a gardener. <laughs> It's like. Right. It's one of those. It's one of those things where he's kind of putting him over all of creation. Okay. His job was to kind of watch over. So those things were created for him to look after. Part of our relationship with God is the fact that as he looks over us, he gives us a job to look over something else so that you kind of get the understanding of understanding him. Yes. You're with me, okay? Verse 18, And Lord God said, It is not good for man to be by himself. I will make for him um, a strength corresponding to him. What does your translation say? Companion. A companion, okay? Suitable for helping him. Right. Ezer. Ezer is a helper. Okay. Okay. Someone there with them, someone who is a helper. So it comes from the same word as Eliezer. Okay. And God fashioned from the ground every, every animal of the field and every bird of the skies and brought it to the human to see what he would call it. And whatever the human, whatever Adam would call it, each living being, that would be its name. And the human gave names to every domestic animal and the bird of the skies and every animal of the field. But he did not find for the human a, a helper or someone corresponding to him. 
That, that seems to imply that he was looking for a helper th for him from, from the animals. Yeah, that was part of, his, mm. part of his test, yeah. The thing is, God creates man. He creates everything. Now, surely God, you would have, God would have known that there was none like Adam, right? Mm. And mm. yet he allows Adam to go through this realization of looking through every single animal. Mm. What's the point? What's also interesting there, it says, so from the ground, Adam and I, God formed every wild animal. So they were also made from dust. Or for the ground, yeah. Mm. And if you look, think of it, the breath of life was also imparted into them. Mm, All spoke, living, spoken in. Spoken into yeah. them. So every, every animal has also got the, that breath of life in it. In, in it. Yeah, they have, a, they have, but not in the same way we do. No, no, yeah. no, we always do, but they obviously, because flesh, no, anyway, it's not yeah. going to that. Flesh is flesh, you know, we flesh is as much yeah. as an animal's flesh. Yeah, no, there's definitely life in every animal, but in uh, the life of the animal, it seems like they have two parts to them, that life and flesh, and we have that spirit with, with that on top of it. Yeah, I also... Going back to that soul, mind, will, and emotions, they yeah. say the soul is actually subject to the mind, which is the will and the emotions, and the spirit mm. is actually subject to the heart. Depending again on what you're actually going to be. If we take it from the point of the tabernacle is what we're going to get back to. Mm. So we're talking about from like the Holy of Holies to the Holy Place to the outer court. So, obviously, if you love someone, you're going to make that a priority. But it's a way of the communication where God's throne is sitting in your life is the communication is through the Spirit. And then it becomes part of your responsibility and what you're going to do thereafter. That, that combined is going to make the body do what God either told you to do or what you told you you were going to do. Yeah, well, that's the will and the emotions. Right. We get stuck in the middle. Yeah. Nine times out of ten. But if you understand, Look at the heart from a different perspective where God actually deals with you more in your heart. Then the heart is the... If you give your life to the Lord, you're actually giving it to your heart, not your emotions. In your yeah. heart. Because if you look at some of the churches today, they all focus on emotion. Yeah. Yeah. And then they come up and they do a little sinner's prayer, which you obviously think you're doing with your will. Yeah. But you've got to have a change of heart. Yeah. That's where your spirit enters into you, not through your mind or your emotions. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, it's, yeah, it, that, this is why you would say, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Yeah. It should always be the center of our, of our understanding or our motivation. I think a commitment, too, is from the heart, not from your emotions. Your emotions change all the time. Yes. I can influence your emotions with music. Yeah, well, that, isn't that exactly what happens? <laughs> Or other things. Yes, right. Okay. So, he comes in, he creates all of it, and he says, listen, there's these two trees, everything's great, but don't eat that one. Now, listen to the instruction very carefully. What is God's instruction there? 99% is, 90% is his, and is yours, and 10 is <laughs> so yeah, okay, there's a point of not allowed to touch that. That's okay. not allowed. What is the actual words of the instruction? I need you to pay attention to it because in chapter three there, there's there's a there's a context shift. When Satan looks at it and he quotes this, he's gonna twist something. I need you to be aware of it. Does he not say that? He says, if, be careful, because in that day you eat it, you will die. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there's a couple of ways that we can, we're going to unpack that. But he goes, listen, there's a death sentence attached if you eat of that fruit. Okay, verse 18 says, and Lord God said, it is not good for human to be into myself. Or did I read that part already? No, I did, sorry. Mm -hmm. we were down to right. But, okay. So he goes in and he gets Adam to name all things. And Adam's realization... There's nothing corresponding to me. No. There's none like me. I remind you again, in whose image was man created? So was there really none like him? No. His focus should have been on God. Creation 
And then I go, I don't see it. And Abba goes, well, look at me and I look at you. We're the ones that are each other's. You are my helper. We were created in his image. We are the Eve in Adam's story to God. Yeah. You're the bride of Christ. That is your picture. Mm. We still do that. Eh? Yeah. We compare to the wrong thing. We complete, Adam completely misses the point here. Mm. And he goes, well, look at all these animals. There's none like me. Mm. God's like, okay, you don't get it. I'm going to help you understand it. So this is him helping understand the spiritual truth. Mm. It's the same as, you know, when uh, before you become a father, you don't really understand the love of a father. Mm. If, if I can put it that way, you don't understand the sacrifice a father will make or a mother would make. Mm. You understand it intellectually, but when it's your own children, there's something that's different, right? Yeah. You get to experience it on a different level. It's the same as if you have never been married, you don't truly understand the, I suppose, the joys, the intimacy, and also the struggles of marriage, which makes you stronger, which builds your connection, which hopefully builds levels of deeper appreciation. Right? It is to help you grow and to move forward and to become a chad, which we're going to talk about in a bit. And in that process, there's victory. Right? Yeah, he just doesn't see it. So he gets him to experience it. He says, he caused him to slumber, and he descended on the human, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed flesh in its place. And the Lord God built the rib that he had taken from the human into a woman and brought her to the human. And the human said, this time is it, bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. This will be called woman. And the, for this, one was taken from man. Similar realities. Okay. Interesting wordplay. Now, we've been hearing a whole bunch of Adam. Adam, 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 Adam. Right? Mm. Humankind, mankind. But this is not what he calls her there. What does he call her? Woman. 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 Yeah, is this a play on the word Adam? No. Sorry. No, in Hebrew it's the word? Ish. Ish and Isha. Okay, there's an interesting little side. I know you guys are getting a lot of Hebrew, but... <laughs> the more you get exposed to it, the more you'll, you'll get used to it. Bring it on, brother. <laughs> All right. So, if I look at the way we spell it, Believe it or not, this in Hebrew says ish. 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 Uh -huh. ish. ish means man. Okay, and if you want to break that down for a second, the first of the hand of God that brings what? You've got bookmarks, that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's go with it. First man. <laughs> the first oh, off. This is a shin. Which one? Shh, this is a shin. The wobbly. Okay. First cut. What? So you get the first bead that separates. 
Is that the possibility? Say it again. First deed. Yes. First. The first deed that separates. separates. As in the man, like that's different. Uh, As in the man that is literally going to be something that separates from who? Yeah. From God. Uh, he allows sin to come in and then he causes a separation, does he not? Yeah. We're going to get into that. And isn't that funny that it might be certainly uh -huh. written in these titles at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, but if we look at this, that's not what I want you to focus on. I want you to see this little reality. Ish has got the same two letters, or it's got these two letters in here for Isha. Isha is the word for woman. So when woman came from man, you can literally see that reality in the way it's spelled. It's like man and woman. You just added a part or took away a part so that you could be part of, in a sense. Two became separate so that the two then can become a thud again. Now here's an interesting little Hebrew funny. This, in many cases, represents God, right? Mm -hmm. It's the Yud. It's the first letter in his Yud He Vav He. It's the Y. Now, what happens if I take God out of the, this reality? Or if I take, that is the He, which is the H. Mm -hmm. If I take God out of man, and I take God out of woman, I am left with the same two letters. Mm -hmm. An Aleph mm -hmm. and a Shin. That is Esh. Yeah, that's the <laughs> and man without God, woman without God equals fire, as in destruction. You take God out of his creation, he's doomed for destruction. You with me? Mm -hmm. Interesting things that you can chase down with the paleo now, right? <laughs> How do I make it work? Okay. So, he says, This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This will be called Isha, for she is one that was taken from Ish. Verse 24. On account of this, a man leaves his father and his mother. A man leaves his father and his mother isn't the woman that normally leaves. I was kind of thinking of that because when they get married, the woman gets taken to his, his father's house where mm. he's built on for them. And mm. here it says, mm. it, sounds, it sounds opposite. Yes. Mm. So then what is he talking about here? A man must become independent. He needs to step out and stand on his feet so that he can do what, Lord? Let's see. It says, on the count of this, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife. That's nice, eh? <laughs> clings to. Any translation there? Any other translation in the word cling? United. United, joined. And they become one flesh. Basar Echad. Now this word Echad, you know, you know very well. I'm going to make some space, okay? Okay. Basar is flesh or meat, really. Animal meat. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, if you if you if you go when you're looking for if you're looking for red meat, you would use that word basar, it's like a steak. Echad, one as in what? One as in singular, as in one, one unit, as in a unit, or one, which talks about unity. Now, where do we see this word? Because this is the first place we ever see this, which God goes, this is important, you need to remember that word. Where does he tell us that that's a really important thing to remember? I'll give you a clue. It's your rabbi's favorite or most important commandment. In the Shua. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. So go. Go to Deuteronomy 6. Tell me what you see there. Verse 4. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is alone. There, stop there. That word for alone is echad. Echad, no one. Now, some translations will say the Lord, you will read it in English, and you will say the Lord is one. And I have sat opposite a person and said, how can Yeshua or Jesus be God? Because God is one. How can Jesus be God? How can Yeshua be God if God is only one? Does he mean like one God? Ooh, one God is in singular. Or does it mean one God is in unity? Yes. Unity. Right. What we read there is we read singular. So we see God the Father and this other guy. The Son is a good guy, but he's not really God because there is only one God and that is... What's the problem with that logic? What did you learn in the first line in Genesis? In the beginning, Elohim. Did you not all just write down that Elohim means three or more? So then how can it be singular if he's Elohim? There would have been, in the beginning, God, El, created the heavens and the earth. Case closed, done, it means singular. But it didn't do that, did it? In the beginning, Elohim created. And as you parallel that with John chapter 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, we're getting into some um, difficult territory. Okay, I want you very... Yeah, I think Russia's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to put this in a... He's going, he's going back many years. <laughs> <laughs> I can see his... He's trying to use simplification for our little brains. Rachel, stay there. What? Just stay where you, you are. Stay where you are. Rachel? Yeah? Who's speaking to you? No one. Yeah, where you're on. She's going to cut me deep with the We just spoke to you. <laughs> All right, no, no. Was it Daddy's voice or was it Daddy? Daddy's voice. So it's not part of Daddy. No, it is part of Daddy. Okay, so which one is it? Was it Daddy's voice or was it Daddy? Oh, it's Daddy and Daddy's voice. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. You made my point. <laughs> In the beginning was the word. <laughs> You're starting to understand. As you are made up in parts, the simplest way I can put this for you is that when God speaks, His Word is so powerful it can become a being. The very Word itself that emulates from the being who speaks it. This is Yeshua. Now, you with me so far? Right. I want you all to try something. Say a word without breathing out. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> huh? No, no, without, no. That's just breath. 
without breathing at all. Speak. Uh, <laughs> Why can't you do that? Without breathing. Without breathing. No, without breathing at all. No, no in the heart. Just go on. Why not? Because breath is life. Because the breath and the word always operate together. <laughs> Who's the breath? The Spirit. Holy, Spirit. Yeah, Holy Spirit. So, Yeshua was breathed into existence into Miriam's belly, yeah? Yeah. And in the beginning, the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters like a dove. Yeah. And yet, that same being resurrected Yeshua, and when Yeshua ascended, he sent him down to come and dwell with you. You never see the Holy Spirit and the Word operating really independently. Now, is the Holy Spirit part of God? Let's prove the point. Rachel? Mm -hmm. Was that me or was it my breath? Both. Exactly my point. <laughs> Both emulate from the Father. The Word and the breath both come from God. Now, when you talk about the deity of Christ, is the Word God? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the Word above God? No. no. Because your Word cannot be above you. They both come from the being who speaks it. This is why you can find Yeshua praying to the Father, saying, not my will be done, but yours. Why? Because the one who speaks it is above the one that's spoken. Yes. There's hierarchy. You with me? In the same way, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, the one who breathes it is above the breath who's breathed. Sure. Mm. To what better than the egg analogy, I must say. <laughs> 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 Yeah, this, 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 was, this was revelation. The fullness of Him is a simple echadness, just like spirit, soul, and body. <clears throat> but the best way, the easiest way we can get it is we can go word, breath, being. Mm. This is one aspect of the, the complex Plurality yet unity of God. You with me? An, an interesting thing is if you go to Genesis 1 and you read, let's go to Genesis 1. Uh, in Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God created. Now, if you think about who is the, the narrator, the one who's giving the message, is the Word. And the Word immediately says, talks about God, the Creator. So the Word is the one who's giving the message. So in the beginning, is, is the, the narrator is the Word. And then he immediately says, God created. So that's God's the Creator. And then going on there further was, it says... You know, the darkness was in the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, and the, the third one, the Spirit of God comes into the thing. So, in fact, they're all separate, but they all come from one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this, this is what we struggle with, is how can I be different? How can they be separate and how can they be one? How can they be hierarchy and how can they be different? You know what I'm saying? Just for now, we're just going to stick to the simple breath word <coughs> analogy. Okay? Echad, basar echad, is going to be the picture of what? It becomes a bigger picture of that, but the baseline is of marriage. Right? You become one flesh. Now, isn't it interesting in Genesis, you see this very funny pattern. God comes, he sees something, he separates it. Yeah. 
separates the waters and then he brings forth something and then he brings two together. He separates Adam in a second and he brings them together. Mm. It's like this continual process of... He always separates, divides, and then, and that's then he it. brings together stronger. Right. So if this becomes the picture of marriage in the beginning, and remember, this is the picture that you were made in my image for a relationship with me. This becomes part of an extremely big picture. Sorry, that becomes part of the picture of a point of relationship. That becomes, that scripture comes to bring the new. Part of. And also he comes to unite. Mm -hmm. Then Noah, the waters. <laughs> the separation is bringing. Evil and good. You see that whole pattern throughout Genesis. And you're going to see another one where it continues on with the seed, and we're going to get to that in a bit. But you guys so are with God me. Put division, multiplication. Right. You guys want to take a break before we get to chapter 3? We've been no. sitting for 50 minutes, believe it or not. Oh, sure. Just Go, chapter 3. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. <laughs> Okay, and the snake was slyer than every animal of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, let's pause, who is the snake? Satan. How do you know that? Okay. Keep right, child. <laughs> no, I was going to say. You were going to say. my father's voice. <laughs> and I looked so, at his notes. How do we know this? <laughs> So, we turn to Romans 16, we might <laughs> Not actually, you tied in with the wrong point. Oh. It says what? So, yeah, th is this just a little snake or is it Satan? Which one is it? I think it's Satan. All right, well, that's what, that's what we've been taught, correct? <laughs> now you'll have rabbis, including the commentary of this one of what I'm reading here, who will say, listen, <laughs> Christian theology, you've lost your mind. Right? Because there was no such thing as the Satan in the garden in rabbinic thought. So let's test it. Right? So, if we believe this is Satan, listen to the question. Has God indeed said you may not eat from any tree of the garden? No. What, what is the question? Has. What was the instruction by God? Do not eat of this tree. You may, you may eat from all the trees yeah. except. Yeah. Except for that one. So, yeah. were they allowed to eat of the tree of life? Yeah. Yes, they were. Yes. They were allowed to. There was only one exception. Not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so they were allowed to. The sad reality is that they actually never did. We're going to get that into that. We're going to get into that in a bit. So we go into this scenario. So we have this. Do we have Satan... Asking a misleading question anywhere in your Bible. Yeah. Okay, the simplest reality would be where? Matthew, Matthew chapter? 14. Matthew. Four. Matthew 4. Okay, go quickly to Matthew 4. Matthew <laughs> 4. Okay, what do you see in Matthew 4? Is it Matthew 4? Yeah. So what do you see? Temptations. Temptations. Oh, what was the questions? Ask, yeah, what does Satan ask? Um, he asked, he... If you are the Son of yeah, God. Yeah, if you are the Son of God, turn the stones. 
Okay, if you are the son of God. Okay, so he starts with this sort of an identity reality and then he tests their understanding of who he is. What is, if this is Satan, is he doing something similar in the garden? Yeah. What does he say? Does he give a statement that's misleading or does he ask a question? A statement. In Genesis. Um, yeah. Genesis. 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 <laughs> in the beginning, God mm -hmm. made man and woman. Yeah. And he made all the duties. Yes. Satan wasn't there yet. How do you know? Who is Satan? It's an angel. Or an angel. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not done. Do you, do you agree that he made everything in seven days? Yes. When did he make the heavens? He made the heavens. So how do you know they weren't created with the heavens because that's where they dwell? But he doesn't say that in the word. <laughs> because he doesn't want you to focus on when he was focusing on genetic beings. He was focusing on Moses. How did we get here? <laughs> it is. I was but thinking about it. <laughs> this is why it's one of those things when he says he created the heavens and the earth. Um, let's ignore the fact that he created... All these billions of galaxies, and we're talking about three heavens, right? Mm -hmm. Scripture teaches three heavens, mm -hmm. right? What are the three heavens? The blue Right, where the birdies fly. Yes. Second heaven? The galaxies. Where the other elements live. Right, where the sun, the moon, and the stars, and such things. Where they are. The third heaven? Oh. <laughs> Their heaven. <laughs> yeah. The very throne room of God. That's where the angels are. So when he said he created the heavens, Mashamayim, Hashuma is again that in plural. It's sort of alluded to that the angels were Already sort done. of then created in that reality. <coughs> okay? And that's a whole nother lesson in itself. Okay. I think now that's what the angels look so funny. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, we didn't get it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he goes in and he creates them. And how are you sitting with this, this question? What I'm trying to do is trying to show you, okay, is this sort of a, uh, does this sound like, a Satan type question from what we know happened with Yeshua. Has God indeed said you may not eat of any tree of the garden? Mm -hmm. It is sort of a misquoted leading question, is it not? Mm -hmm. As in? Yeah, in what, what verse are you reading there? Uh, in Matthew 4, verse 1. Yeah. So he wasn't... Well, he was... No, no, no. Matthew, yeah, Matthew 4 it says the Spirit okay. led him into the wilderness and then Satan tested him. Okay. He's not quoting Scripture. He's giving his interpretation. Oh, yeah. It's always... It's always a couple of words of Bible and then a, and then a slight left or slight right with Satan. Okay? So we see the pattern is kind of similar. But maybe we need a little bit more of a harder proof. Go to Revelations 12, verse 9 to 14. See what you find. Revelation 12. Mm. When you get there, 9 to 14, read it for me. So, the great dragon was cast out, and the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, the strength, and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of your of our brethren have accused them before our God day and night, and have been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you will dwell in them. Woe to inhabitants of the earth. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So he goes to the ancient serpent, right? Yeah. Okay, does that sound similar to a Genesis story? Mm -hmm. Okay, what about Ezekiel 28? 
This is an illusion, an interesting one. Ezekiel 28. Yeah. Well, this is where we're going to get another another interesting one. Go to yeah, Ezekiel 28. And if you've got a subheading there, what does it say? A message for the king. Message for the king of Tyre, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, where's Tyre? No. It's no. No. Okay, it's just above Israel. So Tyre and Sidon. Mm -hmm. You hear Messiah say that a lot. Mm -hmm. What does it say there to the king of Tyre? <laughs> read, the, read the words. It's very, it's a very interesting illusion. Is it the whole thing? No, from where it says to the king. Oh. Well, yeah, no, no, no. Read, read, read from the beginning when it talks about the king. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald of gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was created for you on the day you were created. Isn't that interesting? Was the king of Tyre in the garden of Eden? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. I thought that was about the king of Tyre. Mm. So what we do is, again, like we have, I've mentioned to you before, we have those prophetic four shadows that point to Christ. We also have four shadows that talk about Satan. Mm -hmm. You were in the garden. Mm -hmm. now, hang on a second. I thought he was an angel and he was in heaven. He's a fallen angel. Well, well, that's another fun topic of when did he get kicked out of heaven. He fell through <coughs> <laughs> Okay? <laughs> so we have, to, we have to deal with different... We have to deal with different timelines. Okay, that's, I think Revelation 12 gives a nice explanation of that. And here we kind of see it hidden. It says, you were in the garden. You who is an accuser. You who tries to ask these questions to lead people astray. In Revelation 20 verse 2, it also calls him the ancient serpent. Okay, so he identifies him as such. And Ezekiel goes, oh, hang on a second, you were just like him. If you look at the beginning of Ezekiel um, 28, mm. listen to this part. He says, because you are so proud and have said, I am God, I sit on the throne of God surrounded by the sea. Mm. So again, isn't this whole debacle mm. setting up that you will become like God if you eat of this fruit? Mm. It's funny that we have a similar agenda. Right? Mm. So it looks like we can identify him in the beginning thereof. If we can just jump a little bit ahead in Genesis 3, verse 14 to 15. Read that for me quickly. Genesis 3, 14. What does it say? Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl in your belly, groveling in the dust, as long as you as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Okay, so yeah, it talks about this enmity between and that which man and, or in some cases believe, that's Yeshua trying to crush the head of the serpent. Listen to Romans 16 verse 20. 16 verse 20 it says and god the source of peace shalom will crush the adversary under your feet and it's almost like paul in the writings of romans is again selling that thing where there will be this enmity between the two where you will tread the head of the snake here he again goes he will crush the adversary hasatan under your feet it seems to be an illusion to Romans, I mean to Genesis 3.14. Okay? So, through a little bit of study, we believe that we can sort of, well, for the most part, identify this as not just a snake, but Satan himself.
Okay, it's not 100% clear cut, but I think it gives you enough evidence to be able to consider it. Now let's go back to Genesis 3. So, in the same operation of what he did with Yeshua, has God said to you, you may not eat of any tree of the garden? Now listen carefully. When Satan tries to trap you, he asks you a question to get your understanding. He gets you to question something. What did he do with Yeshua? If you are the Son of God, his question is testing his identity. His question is testing his understanding. You are going to live out what you believe. Correct? So what happens if I don't believe the Word of God? Or I believe that I should rather do this instead of that. Is your testimony going to be that of the same as? Well, this is why I suppose what we do here is a little bit different than what's expected everywhere else. Your walk is based on the belief, here anyway, or I'm trying to get it into you guys, that if you believe that you are a disciple of Christ and you are to make disciples according to the Great Commission, if you believe you're a Christian, as in a follower of Christ, that you need to live like Christ, obey and teach others to obey everything that he taught you, and you are to mimic him accordingly. Those are three different verses. Do we agree? So when you believe that you are supposed to follow Christ to the T, what he did becomes your pattern. Not whether or not you agree with it, but whether or not you want to become like him. I can find 50 different reasons why I don't feel like sitting in a synagogue on Shabbat, sitting here listening to people waffle on about stuff. Maybe I don't like you guys because you annoy me, and then I just don't want to be around people today. Mm. <laughs> Being very dramatic. And then I just go, you know what, I'm, I'm tired, and I am had a rough week, and I just don't, don't want to do it. Can you blame me? I just need a me day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you that you do it. <laughs> no. The reality is, is, if, is, is it, I don't care whether you think you need a me day, was Yeshua in a synagogue busy with his father's business on Shabbat? Yes. You want to be like him, then shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it like it is. We make excuses. <laughs> We make excuses. Oh, it's too far. Oh, it's too hot. Oh, it's too cold. No, I don't think that fits. No, I don't agree with that interpretation. No, I don't want to do this. And we use theological loopholes. The question is, did Christ do it that way? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Then what's your excuse? None. So then what's your stumbling block? Because God is, God is blue and... No, no, no. What? <laughs> no, if you're sick, it's fine. But the reality is, is that we get to the point of... Um, uh, pick a mitzvah. Anyone, throw one at me. The what? Um, An instruction. Mow the lawn. No, no, no. Honor your mother and your father. Honor your mother, there we go. <laughs> Mow the lawn. <laughs> Okay, a mitzvah is an instruction, right? So if if scripture says, honor your mother and your father, as Uncle Del says, I sit and I have to go, I don't really f want to, but I'm nasty to me. Yes, they didn't listen to me, they didn't give me my money, they didn't do whatever. You can justify your, <laughs> your emotional response will tell you X, Y, Z, but the pattern of what Christ did to install in you so that you could reflect God is what you need to fall back on. Um, yeah. If you love God, you love people. Is it always easy to love people? No. no. And yet we do it because our focus is on Him. Right? You don't love people because they're worthy of love. You weren't. You were not worthy of love. But it's also it comes back to it's not really in I do not not love him, I it's the things that he does. Right. 
<laughs> but at the same time, no. But we're not just talking about whether or not he's worthy of love. In the sense of it's the love is an action of how do I meet the need. So how then do I love him? Think, think, think about it this way. In a, in, in a marriage, you're upset with your husband. Are you going to make him dinner? <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> he can starve. <laughs> right? The answer should be yes. Why? Because you love him and you need to meet that need. that's the right answer. <laughs> yes. It's the same as when Yeshua was being crucified, was he still teaching? Yeah. He was still teaching. Don't tell me you can't make a, you can't make supper. You cannot love your wife. You cannot love your neighbor. You cannot love this person. Because love equals action. Maybe they were completely wrong. Just like the people that were cruc crucifying Yeshua, mocking him and making fun of him and saying you weren't really who you said you were. They were completely wrong. And yet he never cursed them. He never swore at them. He never told them off. He never said, just wait three days. I'll see you guys. No, no. Me and my armies are coming. I'm going to knock on your door first. He was sitting there and he was praying for them, interceding on their behalf. The thing is, do you want to become like Christ? Now that becomes part of your understanding, your belief set of why you do what you do. If you have a skewed belief set or a skewed theology, you're not going to live like Christ. You're going to live like your version of Christ. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between you and every other congregation, whether Jewish or Christian here? Because they, have, they all have their own version. Christ was a good man. You can sit in the synagogue and they can go. He was a good man, but he wasn't God. So therefore... His teachings and that we kind of just push to the side. You can go into a Christian congregation and they can say, you know what, Christ actually taught that he's the Lord over Sabbath, so you don't have to worry about Sabbath anymore, it's fine. Mm -hmm. So we'll get together on Sunday. Their interpretation thereof will lead them into a different obedience. Some of them will say, oh, you don't have to worry about eating kosher, Christ, Christ told us it's fine, we don't have to. It's not true. But it will lead them to that reality. The problem is, is that you're going to misrepresent the instruction. Listen to the fall. God gives a clear instruction. Do not eat this. Leviticus 11. And what does Satan do? Did he really say, he really say that? Do you think God really cares what you put in your mouth? I mean, come on, with eternal salvation and all the rest of it that's at play. Do you think he really cares about what you put in your mouth? Don't be ridiculous. All of a sudden, I've taken an instruction of God and I've made it less than. Listen to what Satan does. Has God indeed said to you, you may not eat from any tree of the garden? Look at where he aims it at. And the woman said to the snake. Who was the instruction given to? Adam. Adam. Interesting. So now all of a sudden I'm asking a question to someone who's heard it from another person. Possibly. Who's the one that should have answered? Adam. And yet we find woman jumping out. She said to the snake, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, but from the fruit of the tree that is within the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it and you shall not touch it or else you will die. Oops. Is that true? Yeah. No, he said, don't eat it. Did he say anything about touching it? Mm -hmm. Oh, so look at what Satan did. He took away from an instruction and she added to an instruction. And in those two formulas, you've got yourself the fall of man. You broke everything. Torah clearly, clearly, clearly states, do not add to or take away from this word. Doesn't it even carry on all the way to Revelations when it says, listen, do not add to this or take away from it? Nothing's changed. God said, listen, I, this is what I said. This is my standard. Can you please live that out? Yeah, but... Our own version of the truth is not the truth. God's truth is the truth. Theology goes out the window when you're dealing with the authority of the king. He said... Do not do this. Or you can do this, this, and this, and this. But with that one, don't eat it. 
but now I'm teaching other people, don't touch it. Is this something we find in theology today? Mm -hmm. Right. Becomes part of an instruction. I develop an idea and I make it your reality and then we have a new denomination because that's the way we do it. You've taken your eyes off the copy of Christ. Okay? Listen to what he says. So, and the snake said to the woman, you won't die. Which part? Eating it or touching it? Touching it. You won't die. Because he knows. You won't die. Remember, she said you will not. Touch. You will not eat from it and you shall not touch it or else you'll die. And he goes, you won't die when you touch it. Yeah. Maybe when you eat it. Because God knows, listen to this, God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be, what's the next words? Like God. Oh, goodness. God is so scared that you eat this fruit from this tree that you will become like him. Then what's he going to do? You won't need him anymore. Maybe, maybe you'll be so intelligent you'll be able to go and create your own world. I don't know. What was he alluding to? What's going to be the offshoot of this? And he says, your eyes will be opening. You will be like God, knowing good and bad. And the woman saw the tree was good for eating. Her natural response was, where did the sin start? With the eyes. And that was an attraction to the eyes and the tree was desirable to bring about understanding. She saw it. She thought about it. She and she took some fruit and she ate. She did it. She looked. She thought. She grabbed. When Yeshua teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at someone with hate, with lust, with you fill in the gap, does that not become the reality of where all sin starts? Then you think about it. And then what? Well, then you just wait for opportunity to do it. Sin that you carry around a lot of the time has to do with what's between your ears. <laughs> well, it's actually all encompassing. It goes from here to here, and then it comes, yeah, 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 no, no. It's just hypothetical. Yeah. And we carry around thoughts that are planted. We have to be cautious. Okay. Listen to the next few, few ones. He goes, and gave to her man with her as well. And he ate. What does your translation say? She ate and then? Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Oh, so Adam this whole time has been doing what? Standing <laughs> next to her. Standing there next to her, keeping quiet. He had the instruction. He didn't open up his mouth. She jumped ahead, she grabbed it, she ate and then she turned to him and she said, come on. Now, Eve's sin, was it different to Adam's? Yeah. Think about the motive. What was Eve wanting? The fruit. She wanted the fruit so that she believed, firstly, the, the lie, so that she could become like God. Yeah. And what did Adam want? Food. <laughs> <laughs> the woman. He he, exactly that. He fell because of his love for her. What love? They've been together for four, four hours. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. Four, four thousand. <laughs> flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Once I'm fruit. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> that was it. He was in. His focus was on her. Her focus was on herself. You see the difference? 
it's funny how man's love led him into sin and her desire for that knowledge or led her to sin. Okay, now let's take a step back. We know the story well. God goes, I know you're broken. How are we going to fix you? Well, mankind in general. So he says, Are you jealous? So you looked at the tree, then you decided, then you ate it. What instruction can I give you to look at something and think about what I need you to think about instead of what you want to think about? Can't think of anything. Having a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Numbers 15, verse 37. Numbers 15, verse 37. Oh, wait, that, we know this verse. You, you know, know it well. Uh, <laughs> you know it well. Go to the Let's well, let's read what it says. 15. Numbers 15, verse 37, onwards to the end of the chapter. <laughs> <coughs> Numbers 15 verse 37 from 37 to the end of the chapter. Tessels on the garment. Yeah, let's read. Again, again the Lord spoke to Moses. <laughs> Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, you must make tassels for the hems of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commandments of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves as you are prone to do. Um, the tassels will help you, help, the tassels will help you remember that you must obey all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of, out of the land of Egypt that I might be your God. I am the Lord your God. Okay. So he says, all right, I know how you operate. You look at something and then you want it and then you go. Scripture doesn't say just defiling yourself. It gets a little bit stronger. It says that you will go whoring after. You will. As mm -hmm. in you will sell yourself for whatever you see with your eyes. Tell me that's not what people do. Mm -hmm. I want that type of lifestyle. I will sell my soul to get that. I want to I want to do this. I want that person. I want that. You will stop at nothing until you achieve that. And you will sell the fact that you were made in God's image out from underneath yourself just so that you can achieve something. And he says, all right, in Numbers, he says, sit, sit. I want you to remember this reality because, let's put it this way, is sit, sit for people that are not spiritual. Why not? If you have the Holy Spirit, you've got the law written on your heart. Why do you need sit sit? But if I have the Holy Spirit, I have the conscience of God, then because don't we I? Need to look. <laughs> your eyes must see. And other people's eyes. eyes. And other people's eyes must see. Okay. So you do believe that wearing sit sit are for holy spirit filled believers, yes or no? Yeah. What example do you have? <laughs> I love where your head's at, yes. A holy spirit filled man. Oh Yeshua. Did Yeshua wear sit sit? Yes. Where did you see that? When the, woman, <laughs> when the woman when the woman issue touched his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in Egypt? <laughs> 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 I thought you were going to I thought I saw it. I saw it on the show I was watching. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 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 I don't
Okay, the word in Greek, kraspedon. Think of a dinosaur. A is a tassel. Okay, some will say as a twisted cord. Let's let's move on. Let's move on from that one. A twisted cord. Move on. <laughs> Don't be little, little hamsters. Look at Uncle Ben. Twisted cord. We see that in Luke 8 with the lady, the hemorrhage that was 12 years. She reached out and she grabbed the corner of his garment. In the Greek, the kraspidon. You also see that in. Uh, Matthew, let's check Matthew 14. Yeah. Matthew, yeah. there's two other places, I just want to make sure. Matthew 14? From verse 34? Andre Villiers. Read for us. When they crossed over, they came to the land. Oh, his name was Eliasit. Kinosaur. Kinosaur. Carry on reading. Yeah. And when the man of the place recognized him, they sent out into all the surrounding region, uh, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. Um, as and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. It wasn't just a lady with the hemorrhage. There were people that came out, they were literally lined out, and as they walked past, they touched the sit-sit, and they were healed. Matthew 14, verse 34, to the end. It was Luke, well, Luke, uh, well, yeah, I've got Luke 8 as well. Luke 8, verse 43 to 48. It's also okay. paralleled in... Yeah, yeah, Luke 8 verse 43. Also Mark 6 verse 56. Same scenario as Matthew 14. Okay, that word kraspedon is also used in a rebuke in Matthew 23 verse 5. When he talks against those who make their tefillim broad and their kraspedon, their sit extra long. He wasn't talking about making the hem of your garment extra long. As some people will say, it was just the hem. The very Greek itself tells you. Twisted cord, tassel of the garment, and also in the rebuke of Matthew 23 verse 5. Same word is used. Okay, so if Yeshua, who we all agree was spiritful than perfect, yes? Mm -hmm. Who had no need he wore them then why don't we I'm asking you as a generic Christian environment out there we believe that we have the Holy Spirit therefore we don't need sit sit mm -hmm. if that logic was true then Yeshua yeah. should he should not have worn it, but here yeah, we have seen in two places that he did. We have no excuse, we have opportunity though. Why? Because it is a Genesis problem. Okay, we all understand that. Sit sit is not because you're perfect. Sit sit is there to identify who you follow, to help you remember. It does, and I should say, uh, yeah, an identification marker not only between you and God, but also for other people to recognize what you stand for. Okay. Um, there's actually a verse in Zechariah where it actually talks about the end. In Zechariah, no, that's in his wings. There'll be healing in his wings. 
that it actually says that he will walk up, a Gentile will come up and grab hold of the, the, the sit sit of a Jew and say, God is with you, take us to your mountain and teach us his ways. Now, if you weren't wearing sit sit, how would he identify you? Okay, it was a marker for God's people. Okay, right, okay, let's get back into Genesis. Okay, so Satan does something quite interesting again. He says, you shall not, okay, we did that part, eh? Your eyes will be no good. She ate and she gave mm -hmm. to her man with her as well, and he ate. Yeah. And the eyes of the two of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Now, did God lie? No. No. But he said, if you eat it, you would die. Why are they not dead yet? It's dying slowly. <laughs> they are Never dead. said how quickly the process would go. Okay, part one. It could be a revelation again. Death entered because of this. Okay, <coughs> and we see that they lived up to a point and then they died. It's going to be in one of the genealogies we're going to go through. Mm -hmm. But the expression is also going to be used in a place where it doesn't talk about immediate death. No. I want to go to... Second Kings, or oh, where, where am I, where am I, where am I, where am I? Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I've got it here somewhere. I think I wrote it Isn't death separation from God? Uh, no, that, that would be a sin marker. Oh, 1 Kings 2. Yeah. Verse 37. 1 Kings 2, verse 37. Going to read from verse 36. So, 1 Kings 2, verse 36. It says, The king summoned Shimei and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, and live there. Don't go outside the city walls. Know for a fact that on the day you go out and cross the Wadi Kidron, you will certainly die. Your blood will be on your own head. Shimei answered to the king, What you have said is good. As my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. So Shimei lived in Jerusalem for a long time. But after three years, two of Shimei's slaves ran away and went to Akish son of Maaka, king of Gad. They told Shimi, your slaves are in Gad. So Shimi set out, saddled his donkey, and went out to Akish in Gad to look for his slaves. Then Shimi returned, bringing his slaves from Gad. Mm. Did he drop down dead? Mm. No. Listen. Mm. Solomon was told that Shimi had gone from Jerusalem to Gad and back. And the king summoned Shimi and said to him, Didn't I... Have you swear by Adonai and forewarn you by telling you, know for a fact that in the day you leave and go anywhere outside the city, you will, you will certainly die. And you answered, what you're saying is good, I hear it. Why then haven't you kept the oath of Adonai and the mitzvah I charged you with? Moreover, the king said to Shimei, you know in your own heart all the terrible things you did to David, my father. Therefore, Adonai will bring back your wickedness on your own head. But King Shlomo Solomon will be blessed, and on the throne of David will be established before God forever. So the king gave the order to Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down so that he died. The expression, if you do this, you will surely die, doesn't have to be immediate. We see here, if you leave, then know that I'm going to account to you. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happens in Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. They go in. And it wasn't an immediate thing. What do you think Adam and Eve did once they ate? Like, oh, oh we, we didn't die. Mm -hmm. That's good. Short-sighted. Yeah. Isn't it? We haven't figured it out yet. Okay. Let's see what happens. They realized that they were naked and their eyes were opened. Mm -hmm. They knew that they were naked and they picked fig leaves and made loincloths for themselves or clothes for themselves. Which part? The fig leaf. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's the worst of anyone. Never have you ever picked things like yeah. that. Oh. It's, it's sticky in <laughs> it. But it's like scratchy and really itchy. Yeah. I mean, really on your sensitive part. <laughs> <laughs> no, on any, you know, on any part. Don't get that <laughs> so now you're dealing with figs, and this is an interesting thing. I want you to go. See, fig, when they realized they were naked in Hebrew, it means that they were really they understood their shame. Yeah. Okay. Nakedness generally equals shame. You know, when God talks about in the prophets, "I will reveal your private parts," mm. and He's talking to a nation. That. Yeah. I'm going to lift up your skirt and I'm going to flash everything to everybody. <laughs> and you're like, this is a really weird thing. He's like, I'm going to uncover your sin. I'm going to shame you in front of everybody. And that expression carries itself through from Genesis the right way through. So the fact that they were naked, they realized that they sinned. They realized that they now are in shame. So they try and make a covering for themselves. Don't you find it interesting? Go to John 1 verse 43. John chapter 1, verse 43, read to 57 for me. From 43 to 57. The following day... Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, um, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Do you, you will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to hear, you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I saw you before you, before you got you, I saw you under a fig tree. What does that mm. mean? Now, according to sort of rabbinic literature, is what we understand is that biblically the fig tree is a picture of Israel in many cases, okay? It's like one like I am the vine, you are the branches type of thing. So the vine also plays along the olive tree, also plays along to certain times of Israel. But this thing of studying underneath a fig tree became a place of study for um, for many a person who wants to go sit. It's hot, so it's a nice big shady place. And the figs actually give off a sweet smell. So I can sit there and I can smell the sweetness. And that's going to remind me that may your words be as sweet as honey. honey. Right. So it's the association of the sweetness and sort of like a shade thing is a place where I would go and study God's instruction. Now think about that. When they walked away from God's instruction, they grabbed a fig tree. This fig leaf. For whatever practical reason, maybe it was a big leaf. Maybe they thought they could work it so that it would cover what they wanted to cover. And then later to try and reverse that, we find Yeshua talking to a, or calling a disciple who's studying the instruction so that he doesn't get it wrong. Where is he studying the instruction? Under the fig tree. One aspect. The second aspect is that how long do you think a fig leaf is going to last? Clothing wise. <laughs> Yeah, not very long. You trying to cover up your own sin, how long are you going to keep it hidden? That which is done in the dark will be called out into the light. This temporary thing that you think you can get away with something, or no one saw me, no one does, no one anything, 
Not long after this, we're going to see something. Let's go back to Genesis and see what happens. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. So you just make a plan of hiding your sin. God pitches up. You think he's surprised? Coincidence? I don't think so. And this translation says it was in the wind of the day. I think your translations will say in the cool of the day. Mm -hmm. And the human and his woman hid from God. Well, the Lord God among the garden's trees. <laughs> Let's just pause and appreciate, appreciate their, bra their brazenness. God who creates everything, and they think they can hide from him. Between trees. Yes, because he can't see. And the Lord God called the human and said to him, where are you? Now, listen to that. Not, hey, you, sitting behind the tree. What did you do? He goes, where are you? Now, he invites them into a dialogue <coughs> by calling to them, but calling them in a question. And he said... I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Where are you? I was afraid and I hid because I'm naked. Who said you were naked? Adam does the ultimate whoops. What you up to? What you doing? Nothing. I just lit the match. What match? How many times have you called children out like that? Yeah. Trying to hide things from their parents? And then you go through this moment of mm -hmm, the slip of the tongue. Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Again, another question. And the human said, the woman you placed with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Oh, well, this is so human. Did you eat of the tree? She made me do it. Mm -hmm. Notice, the woman whom you, oh. it's your fault. You gave me it and now it's broken and then it's not my fault. <laughs> but does it stop there? And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? Question. And the woman said, the snake tricked me and I ate. Blame game. Tell me we've changed. No. Nope. You cannot justify your sin. Remember, mm -hmm. sin is transgressing the instruction. You cannot keep on making justifications why you keep doing certain things or why you did it. You can analyze why you did it to try and get yourself some understanding, but the fact is you still did it. Mm -hmm. You cannot blame Satan for the fact that you made a decision. You cannot blame temptation. The fact is, you made the choice. And until we actually think of the offering system, when I have to deal with my sin, what do I have to do? I bring my animal to the tabernacle, to the entrance of the tent of meeting. I then have to press my sin onto the head of the animal and confess what I have done. If no one else ever caught me, for me to clear that reality, I would have to say out loud, God, I am guilty of this. Now, please take this animal's life as a substitution for me. You know, it's a weird reality. We think that the New Testament is all faith-based and the Old Testament isn't. Do you not have to have faith that God will accept the death of that animal in place of you? It's all faith-based. You have to believe that animal is going to be accepted. The death of that animal is therefore in place of me. It's a substitute. And you have to believe that the sin that you did is going on to that animal. It's all faith-based. Mm -hmm. The process is, do you understand the cost of sin? And we're going to get to that here. He lays it out for us here. He says, the snake tricked me. Verse 14. And the Lord God said to the snake, because you did this, you are cursed out of every domestic animal and every kind of, uh, every animal of the field. You'll go on your belly and you'll eat the dust of all the days. Yo, sorry, you'll eat dust all the days. Ah, oh, dear. You want to be funny. Mm -hmm. Of your life. And I'll put enmity between you 
and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Between your seed. Now I want you to kind of put this from a spiritual perspective. He keeps on alluding to seed. Mm-hmm. Why? Oh, we spoke about this last week. Because mm-hmm. the seed... Did we? Yeah, the seed... Um, the there's something seed. about the fruit. There we go. The seed tells you us can only what type produce. of fruit you will yeah. produce. We are little seed. Yeah. You yeah. produce oh. life time. Now that you have eaten of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, what are you going to produce? The fruit produces death, so you can only then produce death. If you eat of the tree of life, you receive life, and then you can produce life. Make sense? So yeah, he makes a play on. Through you and your seed, there's going to be this continual battle between these realities. He'll strike you at your head. Him. In allusion to Yeshua. And you'll strike him at the heel. Isn't it funny where we kind of see that reality? What happens if I trap a snake on its head? Hopefully it's going to die, but what happens if it bites me while we're doing it? Welcome to the crucifixion. When he conquered the enemy, power, which was death, the deception fall away, but he had to die in the process. See it? To the woman, he said, I'll make you suffer and your labor pain great. You'll have children in pain and your desire will be for your man and he will. Your translation? Rule over you. Rule over you. And he does. Rule over you. Uh huh. No, no, no. Say it, say it over yourself and accept the responsibility. Right. You will desire the control of your husband, but he will rule over you. Yeah. We can make a pit stop here. Give me another five minutes. We're not going to get past this reality. Marriage. Okay, so remember the point of two becoming separate or then becoming one was to become Besar Echad, one flesh, which was a picture again of Elohim, Mm -hmm. which is Echad, Mm -hmm. he is Echad, right? So if marriage then leads us to this and part of this reality is the husband's response or duty will now be to rule. Why? Put everything under him. When the Ephesians five for me quickly. Because he loves her. Very romantic, but Point Ephesians five. five. Ephesians one chapter five. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians five. We're going to read from about verse twenty-one. It says, ah, Ephesians, mm. Ephesians of 5 verse 21 says, Submit to one another in fear of Messiah. Yeah. What does that word submit mean? 
humble to yourself. Food. In the Greek, it kind of gives you the illustration of being accountable to each other. So be accountable. Also understand that you're under to one another in fear of Christ. That's how it starts. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 5, 21. Thank you. Verse 22 says, Wives should submit to their husbands as they do to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, just as the Messiah is the head of the church. Is himself the one who keeps the body safe. Just as the church submits to the Messiah, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now why? He says to rule, and he tells the woman, a wife, your responsibility is to submit. Submit to him because he is submitting to who? God. God. Why? This is a Genesis reality he's talking about in Ephesians. What are we missing? Why is she being told to submit? What did Eve do wrong? <laughs> she jumped the head. Okay? Submission has nothing to do in this context of who's better. Understand that. No woman is less than a man. Okay? You were made to come alongside. You were made to be a helper. You were made to support. But the problem is when Eve jumped ahead, she broke things. <coughs> who was the one who was quiet sitting next to her? Uh, what didn't he do? Among the seed. He didn't Take lead. No responsibility. So, God says, you will lead. Listen to what he says. As for husbands, love your wives, just as the Messiah loved the church. Indeed, gave himself up on its behalf in order to set it apart for God. Funny, he tells us to rule, but rule, he doesn't... Stop there. What does he say? Love. <laughs> he says, your wife must submit and her desire will be for her husband. Hmm. Now, what is more natural for a guy? To love or to stomp his authority when he doesn't get his way? Authority, authority without love is dictatorship. Yes? Mm -hmm. I'm the man of this house. You will listen to me. It says in the Bible that you will. What a lot of men don't understand is that it says there that you have to submit to Christ first. Mm -hmm. Submission is a gift, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a gift you give to Christ. I am yours. I surrender to you, Lord. You are higher than me. I will follow your ways. I'm accountable to him. And because he's holding me responsible, mm -hmm. I'm the one who's going to be carrying the brunt of that. When things go wrong, can I go, that woman whom you gave me? Mm. You can, but it's not right. It's not going to work, is it? says, you're the man, you're the one in charge, I expect you to be. Now in an ideal world, and I say this in a lot of the counseling sessions I do with women or people before they get married, mm. is that submission from a wife is a gift you give your husband. Let me say it carefully, it is a gift. Because there are times when you are probably right and he's probably not going to listen to you. And he's going to get it wrong. He's going to have to learn to take ownership of that reality, yes? Mm -hmm. Just like we're going to understand that we're accountable. When we get it wrong, 
It's not the na 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 that you should have listened to me part. It's the how are we going to fix this? Because what we do as men will affect our entire family. It, does that mean that what women do doesn't affect the entire family? Of course it does. If mommy's in a bad mood, I guarantee you the entire house is in a bad mood. If daddy's in a bad mood, the whole house is in a bad mood. What you do in your house will ref either reflect God, Christ in the church, or it's going to reflect self. Do you know that the stats for divorce are almost as high in believers as it is in the world? What did he say in Ephesians 5? For Christ gave up his life for her. As men, it is your privilege to reflect God in your marriage. You are the image of Christ in that union. And your wives, you are you have the privilege and the blessing of surrendering to your husband as if you are surrendering to Christ. Can I put in an addendum there? Mm -hmm. Only as long as he surrendered to God. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't submit to Christ, if he doesn't surrender to God, if he is acting completely contrary to that, that is already destroyed the hierarchy of that. You understand? It's not just a, okay, you're a man and now I have to listen to your scenario. It is a man surrendered to God is someone you should surrender to. Mm. It's a very different reality. It's not just about, I'm the man, I will rule. Remember, you in this reality is reflecting this basal echad, this oneness, this unity. As Yeshua submitted himself to God, he surrendered. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Is there any other way? Mm -hmm. This is the way I want to do it. Not my will, but yours be done. How many of those conversations have you had as maybe as a married couple? Can we do it this way? Mm -mm. I want to do it this way. I don't think we should do it that way. So, what do we learn? Same as God. He tells you, I want you to do it this way. I want to do it that way. Or do you go, you're smarter than me, Lord, in this instance. Or do we go, all right, to our spouses, to our, in our relationship, do we go, okay, you know what? Ladies, this is an important one. Men, you will listen up to. You will trust if your husband makes a decision that he went to God to go lay it out before him first it's not an intellectual thing I'm hoping my wife will trust me that I'm going to go ask the question of my king mm -hmm. should I do this and if the answer is yes and she still doesn't see it I still have confirmation that God said it's okay for me to do it and then it would be easier for her to follow does that make sense mm -hmm. so it says submit to one another but it says husband's Wives will submit to husbands as they submit to Christ. Why? Because Eve led, now she will have to wait. Husband kept quiet, now he'll have to take accountability. It's not because anyone is better than the other. It is actually trying to get away from the inherent flaw in each of us. If you ask a man, well, if you put a man in a situation, and, well, let me not, I'm going to generalize. Put a lot of men in a situation where they don't have to lead. They don't have to take responsibility. They don't have to get off their butt and do anything. How many men would be happy with that narrative? 99.9. You got it covered. You don't need me. Okay, let me know when you need me. Okay, I'm out. Now I'm going to go do whatever I want to do, and I'm going to do that, and they're going to... The wife or the woman is going to take all responsibility and feel all alone while I go and do whatever I want to do, and that's my reality. 
if it falls to pieces, well, it's your fault. Because I refuse to give anything. It's inherent for men to become passive. So God says, I will hold you accountable. You better be active. And it's easy for a woman when a man refuses to step up to grab hold of it and say, I will just do it. And God says, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. you will sit back and you tell him, him to step up because he needs to do it. I want you to see a seesaw. You have to balance each other out in the submission walk because if you don't, one is going to lean too far over, then you're going to hit the ground or you're going to hit the ground. It's only when we get it right. In the full balance of what, how Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, and God operate, will we understand how marriage is. Is this making sense? There are so many verses in this, in Scripture, to the point where, here's a, here's a scary one for you. It says in, I think it's in Peter, where it says that, Husbands, be careful how, to, how you treat your wives. Because if you mistreat them, God won't answer your prayers. Yeah. And you're like, sorry to say what? Mm -hmm. You misreflecting me. Why would I want? Why would I? Why would I answer your prayer? Love needs to be the heart condition and the motivation of how I rule. And in that. A natural protection for my wife is that I'm going to be the one that's over her. Does everybody love taking the responsibility? No. You call yourself a Christian, it is your responsibility. You call yourself a man in a God-fearing marriage, it is your responsibility. Just like it is. Good. To listen to your spouse. A wise man will take counsel. Know where you're weak and know where you're not. But in the midst of it, to get that balance right, that screams Yeshua mm. and the bride. Mm. That echadness, that oneness, that intimacy, that unity, that balance of this is us reflecting God and His bride to the world. That's what marriage is supposed to be. What have we made marriage? Convenience. Strategic alliances. Partnerships that get mutual beneficials. And when it doesn't work, cancel the contract, move on and find a better one. Or, if it's easier to be alone, be with that brother. Or you fight for the very thing that God gave you. You don't have to think for about how many times you've looked at a marriage and seen in someone else's life how things are run and whether or not it's a biblical reflection of God or not. And what is 99% the biggest problem? This is the interactive part. What do you see out in the world? What is the biggest problem between husband and wife? Come on. No submission from who? Love. Okay. No submission. What else? No love, no submission. No, no love? Authority, no responsibility. <coughs> and this is function. No heart. No Not mm -hmm. according to the word. You see, we've taken God out of marriage as well. Mm -hmm. And now it's just, well, this is what we do. And what in the world? Who invented marriage anyway? This is stupid. Why don't we just live together and see how it works out? Have a couple of kids, and oh, you know what? Let's see where this thing goes. And when it doesn't work out, we find another one. And then we do the same thing. You know, this is the sad reality that we see in congregations. Never mind a world reality. I need you to see, he's trying to fix a mankind problem in Ephesians. We're getting it wrong here because we refuse to be accountable to anybody, let alone to God. 
So how do we fix it? Give me three practical examples and we'll close. Turn back to God. Practically how? Repeat. No, no, no. Don't, I don't want generalize. I want an actual physical point. If you find that there are things in your marriage that is not working, how are you going to fix it? First you have to identify the problem. Communication. Communication is a big part. So if I cannot expect my wife to surrender to me, maybe it's because I'm not giving her any information. I want to do it this way. Why do you want to do it this way? Oh, because I went and I prayed about this and I did that and this is the answer I got. Oh, you prayed about it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Well, if you told me that, or, if we don't communicate, you're never going to get to the point where we had. What else? Come on, there's lots of married people around this table. Let's think practically. Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is going to do what? Prayer to help what? For what? What? What do you How expect do to change in prayer? Yourself. All right. Struggling with what? The other person. <laughs> 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 You get to the place where maybe there's a frustration in yourself where you say now, if I can take it from a lady's point of view, you're struggling to surrender. Is that a God problem or a you problem? That's a you problem. That's a you problem. So, Father, change me. Or maybe I'm struggling with the fact that my husband refuses to sit at God's feet. Prayer, Father, please help him see he needs this. He needs you to guide him. Because as men, we've been told you have to be big and strong and independent and you don't rely on anybody and you need to be able to bench press a car, fix a house and do all types of fun things. <laughs> unless you're a real man. If you can't do any of those things, you can forget about it. We have these stereotypes ingrained in our head. As a married couple, it doesn't say, you know, I don't know. Let me not go down that road. What else practically? Give me one more. Don't be scared, we're family here. Yeah. If there's a speed bump, what can we do? <laughs> Walk instead of drive my car. Don't get speed bumped. She's like, please make this stop. This is touch all peace. Come on, one more thing. How are you going to make your marriage better? Give me one practical way of understanding this reality. Eve jumped the gun. Man forgot to speak. Man rule. Take responsibility. Eve standing back. Maybe it's maybe it's a practical way when a decision needs to make. Allow your man the space to make the decision before you tell him what you think. Maybe then he'll learn to come for counsel first and then make the decision. That's what I said. Walk instead of driving the car. Instead of running away. <laughs> we have to remember that these things are there to teach us a lesson. There are parts in us, ingrained in us, that sometimes we get wrong, but we always justify this is why we do it this way. Again, I'm going to bring you back to what we spoke about in the beginning of the session. If Yeshua did it in a specific <clears throat> manner and we're supposed to reflect Him, how did He show the correct amount of submission, mm -hmm. the correct amount of leadership? Because He's an example of both. He led the church. How then does that reflect, does it look like that's happening in my home? If it's not, Take the time to ask Father, what are we missing? Because if we're missing something, we're not going to be able to become Echad. We're just going to be focused on separation. And you will walk alongside each other. You will not walk with each other. You know the difference? Okay. Let's close. We'll carry on next week. Father, we just want to thank you again for your word. Thank you for your blessings, Father, and this your Shabbat and this family that you continue to put together. Father, thank you for, for your teachings, and I pray that you would help us, Father, not just 
walk out this room and forget about them, Father, but I pray that you would continue to remind us and help us, Father, the things we need to learn so that we can grow, the things we need to apply. Help us, Father, focus on how Yeshua did it so that we can follow him. He got it right every time. Father, help us to be able to do that so we can be an example to those around us. The children, our spouses, our, our family, our friends. Father, that we may be a light in a dying world. That we may bring them to you, Father, so they may sit at your feet. And we just want to thank you for that privilege. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.